Welcome, everyone, to the Fall 2021 Martin Gardner Celebration of Mind talk series. I'm your host today, Bob Hearn, and it's my great pleasure to be introduced to be able to introduce actually my PhD advisor, Eric Domain, uh, which is a little bit funny because uh, I'm 15 years older than Eric. In fact, I'll share a little story. Eric, uh, at the time, this may still be the case, I don't know, at the time he was hired by MIT, he was the youngest faculty member ever. The first conference we went to, he wasn't old enough to drink. So <laughs> it was a little bit of an amusing situation. Um, Eric is a professor of computer science at MIT, a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. Um, he has authored or edited a number of books, uh, including one, one with me based on my PhD thesis, one with Joe Rourke based on uh, folding. And uh, today he's going to be talking about folding. So Eric, uh, take it away. Thanks, Bob. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here gathered in honor of Martin Gardner, one of my favorite people, though I sadly never got to meet him. Um, and I'm going to talk today about what sounds like a really simple problem. You probably know at least one way to fold a cube out of a piece of paper, but surprisingly, there are more and more new ways uh, that we've been discovering uh, to fold a cube just over the last few years. And there's still we still don't have a complete understanding of what folds into a cube. It's like very cool, simple, seemingly simple problem. Um, this is a uh, joint work with a whole bunch of people. You see them listed here. Uh, this is maybe not even everyone I'm, I'm going to mention today, uh, but it has been a fun collaborative uh, project and you're welcome to join in. And I will tell you more about how the collaboration came to be uh, in the middle. Um, but let's start with some ways that you know how to fold a cube. So Martin Gardner wrote about this um, in this, this chapter. I'm gonna have a bunch of quotes from Martin Gardner, because his writing is just awesome. Um, so uh, this is from Mathematical Carnival in the in book form. Um, so you probably know this uh, cross folding of a cube. If you wanted to make a cube, you could cut out a cross and, and fold it up. And it's an example of uh, this type of shape we call a hexomino, uh, which is the, whole, the concept of hexominoes is something that Martin Gardner popularized, though they were, in, I guess, the word comes from, um, domino, like dominoes you play with, which are uh, one by two uh, rectangles, or you can think of them as two squares, and do sounds a lot like two in some languages. Uh, so hexomino is six squares glued together, and there are 35 different ways to glue six squares together. This is them. Um, and some of them fold into a cube, like this cross here, uh, but others presumably not, don't. So this is a puzzle that Martin asked, uh, which, which hexominoes fold into a cube? Um, and the answer turns out to be 11 of them. Sorry to spoil the surprise, but it's fun to figure them out. You probably won't memorize these shapes now, so you can work on this puzzle later. Um, so these shapes fold into a cube, the other hexominoes do not. Um, I think so at least the cross was mentioned in a talk earlier today. So it's a common idea. And a fun thing you can do with the general class of hexomino-like shapes is called polyominoes, where you don't any number of squares glued together. Um, you can see some of the history here. Uh, Saul Gollum um, introduced this concept, but then uh, it really got national attention thanks to um, this 1959 article by Martin Gardner. And uh, one of the fun things you can do with polyominoes is pack them. So here we have um, pentominoes, five, cube, five squares glued together. And if you take all the different ways to glue five squares together, all the pentominoes, you can uh, pack them perfectly into a rectangle. Um, there are lots of cool packings in the space. It's a very popular um, set of puzzles. Um, so we might try to do the same thing with hexominoes, or maybe the hexominoes that can fold into a cube, because today I'm really into cube folding. So with these 11, we call them cube nets, the 11 hexominoes that fold into a cube, um, which of them can, can we somehow pack a rectangle? Let's say using any number of the cross, any zero or more of each of these shapes, can you perfectly pack a rectangle? Sadly, the answer is no. Um, this has been known for a while, uh, but how close can we get? It turns out you can get very close to a rectangle. Here's one uh, example found by exhaustive search of a 13 by 14 rectangle and just uh, like eight one by one holes. Um, 
And that turns out to be optimal for that size rectangle. And in general, for each size rectangle, you can compute what is the minimum number of one by one holes. Uh, and it turns out it's always between, we can prove it's always between four and 14. So even for like a million by a million and seven uh, rectangle, you can get at most 14 little one by one holes. Um, there's a nice general packing, which is illustrated here, at least for one set of examples, uh, where you just have holes near the, the corners. Um, so that's pretty cool. There is a little bit of an open problem. The, the hardest instance we know is six by six, which requires 12 holes. Um, also six by 12 requires 12 holes. We think the right answer is 12, but the best we can prove is 14. Okay, so that was packing cube nets into a rectangle. It turns out if instead of looking at a cube, this is a slight diversion from the cube, I will uh, only do it for the duration of this slide. If you look at two cubes glued together and unfoldings of those, uh, you get these kinds of shapes, and then you can perfectly pack a rectangle, which is quite pretty. Um, all right, so another thing you could try to pack is the cube itself. So here's an example from that same uh, pentomino packing uh, article by Martin Gardner showing uh, a pentomino cube. So this is the surface of a cube drawn in its cross form here. And uh, with wraparounds, it's a little tricky to see, but uh, for example, this edge glues to this edge, I believe, in the folding. And you can see that this extra tab exactly fits into this little pocket down here. Um, and so this is an example where we've taken pentominoes. So these are, again, the five square shapes um, and perfectly covered the surface of the cube using pentomino shapes. I think one of each. But don't quote me on that. I have to stare at this for a little while. Um, so that seems cool. What about cube nets? So the next thing we considered is uh, if you take, again, the 11 cube nets, can you perfectly cover the surface of the cube here with them? Um, and it turns out you can, for at least for certain numbers of uh, cube net shapes. So here, again, we're being flexible. You can use any number of each shape. Uh, so for example, these two cube nets, these two T shapes in the top left, perfectly cover um, the cube. And here we're showing the zigzag unfolding that it overlays. And it's tricky to see all the tabs and pockets, but we checked it. It works. A more extreme example is this. Um, here we have 50 uh, cube nets packing onto the surface of a cube. Uh, so what this means is you could take this cube that's drawn, uh, cut it open, um, and cut it up into lots of little cube nets and then fold it into 50 smaller cubes um, with no loss of material. So that's what we're kind of motivated by. It seems pretty cool. And we know how to do this if you want two cube nets or four cube nets or five or eight or nine or 36 or 64 or 50 and some larger values too. Um, but we don't know about all the numbers in between. In particular, we conjecture that uh, if you take three cube nets, it's impossible to perfectly pack the surface of a cube, yet another open problem. All right, um, so let's move on to other ways to fold a cube. We've kind of exhausted all the things we can do with those cube nets. Um, and if you look at origami uh, for uh, at least hundreds, maybe thousands of years, people have been folding this model, the origami water bomb it's called, but from a mathematician's perspective, this is folding a cube. And it's like most origami, it's made from a square of paper. And it turns out, um, if you take a four by four square, you can fold, uh, this model will make a one by one by one cube. So there's some material waste here and I've tried to highlight uh, the portion, the dark shaded portion here is what actually makes up the surface of the cube and the rest is just, you know, uh, folding around and locking and making it inflate and so on. Um, so that's pretty cool, uh, but can we do better? Could we start from a smaller square and still make a one by one by one cube surface. Um, and this is a prop, one of the few problems in optimal origami design where we know the exact answer. It turns out if you take a roughly 2.8 by 2.8 rectangle square, sorry, um, you can make a one by one by one cube. Um, and this is a result from 20 years ago. Um, and what you're seeing here are my handwritten notes from a class you can watch online about geometric folding algorithms that uh, talks about the proof that uh, this is the best way to wrap a cube. But for our purposes, let's just look at this wrapping here. 
um, you can see in this case in white are the um, is this the material that actually ends up on the surface of the cube. Most of the squares are complete here. And then there's just one square that gets cut up into four um, quarters. And those end up on the uh, corners of the square. And then you just fold away, uh, fold in half these little uh, shaded regions and they'll disappear and you get a cube. So it's clear that that works. And it turns out you can prove it's exactly the best you could do. So if you're allowed to fold, if you're folding from a square and you're allowed to fold however you want, uh, this is naturally the, uh, I mean, this is the answer. This is how we fold cubes, okay? Um, but there are all sorts of other shapes and different types of folding we could consider. So um, let's go back to Martin Gardner uh, a bit later, 1978, wrote this paper on paper cutting, which started my whole career in origami because uh, it talks about a different problem, the fold in one cut problem. But uh, it also talks about this puzzle. Um, so suppose you're given, instead of the 2.8 by 2.8 square uh, that we were just talking about, what if you're given a three by three square? You're allowed to cut it. So you're allowed to make uh, these cuts, for example. And uh, now you're only allowed to fold along grid lines. And you're only allowed to cut along grid lines as well uh, for a three by three square. Can you make a cube? Uh, you can, and I'm cheating here and looking at the answer, you can make a cube. Um, and in fact, there was a paper uh, a few years ago uh, analyzing the number of different ways to cut a three by three square and fold along grid lines and make a cube. Turns out there are 28 different ways to cut it, uh, but only 18 of them fold into a cube and they're shown here. Um, so that's cool. That's one type of folding from a three by three. Um, or another type, we could start from say this one by seven strip of paper, and then we can also make a one by one by one cube, uh, same article. Uh, but here we have to fold along diagonals of the squares, not just along the grid lines. So a little more powerful, different type of folding. Um, so I wanna highlight, uh, we've talked about three different models of folding. We started with, you can fold anywhere, and then we know the best way to fold a cube if we start from a square. Um, uh, or we could uh, fold just along grid lines. That's sort of the least powerful model of our shape. Or we could, in between, we could fold along grid lines plus diagonals. And I'm going to talk about what turns out to be a really cool model is you also allow folding along half grid lines. So this is a uh, three by three square here, which I'm drawing in the purple lines. But then I'm also allowing creases to be midway between those lines. So just a little bit more power. It's kind of in between folding anywhere and folding just along grid lines plus diagonals. I'm going to allow half grids plus half grid diagonals as well. Uh, so let's talk about each of those. So for grid lines, just grid folding, um, you know, if you have the idea is if you have a big enough shape, it should be able to fold into a cube. Uh, but with grid folding, that's not always possible. Uh, because you're not, it's very hard to like change directions with uh, grid folding without diagonal folds. Uh, so these are two examples of rather large shapes um, that do not fold into a cube. And if you restrict your attention to shapes that fit inside a two by n rectangle, so they're kind of height two shapes, then all of the things that cannot fold into cubes look like this. There's one long strip of paper. Um, a strip, because you're always folding perpendicular to the strip, cannot bend into a cube. It can only cover four of the sides of the cube. And if you also add, um, so there's basically slits here, is the notation we're using, and the line, other lines show the connectivity between the squares. If you add little T shapes like this, uh, or little L shapes like this, uh, still you will always on one side of that strip, you won't be able to fold this into a cube. Uh, because you can only cover five out of six of the sides. You need something on the other side. Uh, so you can characterize what these narrow shapes look like. If you fit within, if you have three rows in your shape, um, then the only things that can't fold into a cube are a strip plus some portion of this like three by three picture uh, with these particular slits cut in. Uh, but well, what we don't know is if you start with a shape with four rows, um, which of them fold into a cube and which do not. So yet another unsolved problem in this grid folding model. All right, let's uh, add some power. Let's, let's add in diagonal folds. That seems a lot more powerful because then you can change direction. And um, 
<laughs> it's tricky. So here's here's an example of something that we know. If we look at nanominos, uh, which is nine squares, um, and we look at tree shape, this means that there's lots of slits um, in the in the nanomino. Um, and we want to know uh, what shapes do not fold into a cube with grid plus diagonal folds. It turns out it's the same th same answer is if you just look at grid folds. So here, diagonal folds uh, with size nine, diagonal folds don't buy you any additional power over grid folding. Um, so I mentioned before, uh, you know, there were 10 different ways to cut a three by three square that did not fold into a cube. And uh, that's with grid folding. Here's the same 10 uh, different cuttings that do not fold into um, a cube, even if you allow diagonal folds. We found this by exhaustive search. We wrote a computer program to try all different ways to fold them with grid plus diagonal folds and couldn't find a way to make a cube. So that's neat uh, or kind of weird that diagonal folds aren't helping, at least in this small size. Uh, what if we add half grid folds? Um, and this is the cover animation we saw at the very beginning. Um, and this is a sort of brand new result published last year. Um, so what you see here again is a three by three uh, square uh, without any cuts actually. So previously we were asking with slits, adding slits makes it easier to fold things. Here you don't even need slits. I just drew those dotted lines for reference. Um, and we're just folding along some, some half grid lines and some half grid diagonal lines. Uh, so the whole grid of the cube is kind of just shifted up by half a unit. Uh, and we get a perfect folding of a one by one by one cube. So this is a new way to fold a cube. Uh, cool. Uh, why do we care about this three by three shape so much? Because if it has size nine, and we can also prove, this was actually a somewhat earlier paper, that any shape uh, with at least 10 squares, um, so decominoes or larger, uh, they always fold into a unit cube in the half grid model. I think this is the beginning where we started to realize this half grid model seems really powerful because um, it, it, it proves this intuition that any sufficiently large shape should be able to fold into a cube. A cube only has six squares. How many squares does your shape have to have to guarantee folding into a cube? 10 is the answer. <laughs> because And so this is why we care about nine and smaller shapes, because that's sort of all that's left for the half grid model. Uh, so I showed you size nine shape. Here's a size eight shape, area eight shape, two by four rectangle also folds perfectly into a cube using the half grid model, but not using the weaker models. Um, and here's a area seven shape, uh, sep septomino, um, that again folds into a cube. We're barely using the half grid model. Uh, you may not even call this the half grid, but there is technically a vertex here at a half grid unit, uh, but sort of sort of on the grid, but it's not something we would call grid folding. Um, and in this animation, you see some, some self-intersection, but you can actually fold this in real life uh, just with flexible material. Uh, so um, those are some examples of what we're able to fold. What I'm showing here is from, from the most recent paper, uh, an enumeration of all the different shapes uh, of size seven, eight, and nine um, that, so the top left here is size seven, this is size eight, and this is size nine. These are all of the shapes um, with cut with slits in them that cannot fold into um, a cube with the grid plus diagonal model. And so the question is, which of them fold in the half grid model? What we've shown so far is that all of the purple highlighted ones fold into uh, with the half grid model and we're working on the others. Soon we should have a complete characterization of all of them. It's only finitely many. So just a matter of doing enough computation to figure them out. Um, and if you're interested, just as, as an aside and making these kinds of animations of folding origami designs, you can uh, just draw your crease pattern in a vector drawing program and plug them into this software called Origami Simulator. Uh, it's free, uh, open source online. Uh, just go to origamisimulator.org. It runs in your web browser and you can uh, check out, uh, make these cool animations that I've been showing you. And for us, it's really useful as researchers just to like double check, did we, 
did we transcribe all of the creases, right? Usually we do these on paper first and then we need to check, uh, did it actually work? And we can check that it actually works uh, by running it on the computer. Now I wanna talk a little bit about how uh, we discovered these new ways to fold a cube. Um, these started as open problems, which then became puzzles. So um, there's this paper in 2018 where we proved that all shapes of size at least um, 10 uh, fold in the half grid model. And then we weren't sure about these size nine shapes. So we had these, um, these different ways to cut a three by three square. We knew they didn't fold uh, with grid folds and even grid plus diagonal folds. Uh, but we still didn't know at that point, do they, or do they fold in the half grid model? I think one of them, we knew how to fold this one, uh, but that was it. And so uh, I printed these out and brought them to the origami convention, the origami MIT clubs convention uh, in 2019. This was the last in-person event we had, um, hopefully again soon. Um, and uh, distributed them to all the people, all the origami folders who, who came. I guess I'm wearing an origami t-shirt. I should uh, show it off here. This is one of the first um, origami conventions uh, at MIT. And, uh, you know, we did lots of folding and cutting and messing up. Um, and in the end, we found how to fold all of those slit three by three squares. And then later we found we didn't even need the slits that one of the foldings actually worked for an uncut three by three square. Um, and this is how we ended up with this paper, um, which is the, the one of the three I've been talking about, uh, which included, uh, which I think is quite cool, a middle school student, uh, a then high school student and another uh, then middle school student, I think. Um, and so this is a, a neat example where you can take mathematical research and make it accessible to a very uh, broad audience through origami puzzles. And they could do what the, uh, the math researchers couldn't do because they were so good at folding paper. Uh, so that was a fun, fun result. Um, and I wanna talk about a, a different spin-off, another way you can take uh, how to fold cubes of paper sort of how to fold cubes out of paper, which is when your initial shape has holes in it. And in fact, all of this work that I've been showing you, some of it was motivated by Martin Gardner, but it, we really got excited about it when we saw these two puzzles um, in 2014, just on the web. Um, these are quite challenging puzzles. I encourage you to try them. In one case, we have a two by five rectangle with a slit of length three down the middle. And in the other case, we have a, a three by five rectangle with two uh, one by one holes cut out of it. So the material is this part. And you uh, can, each of these can fold into one by one by one cube, but it's quite challenging to actually execute that. And everything I've been showing you so far are all shapes without holes in them. And holes are much trickier to analyze uh, in terms of folding, holy paper. Um, so we started with this question of, of what hole types are enough to fold into a cube. And we found that there are some holes that are not enough. We call these simple holes because they look relatively simple. If you just take a one by one uh, hole or a one by zero slit or a two by zero slit or this L slit or this U slit by themselves, these are not enough. These shapes that I'm showing you are not enough uh, to fold into a cube. Uh, but if you take any hole that is not one of these five, any other hole, then you're guaranteed to be able to fold into a cube. So that's already most of the cases. Um, as long as your hole is kind of big enough, it's not one of these very short little cuts, um, then one hole is enough to fold a cube, which is pretty cool. Uh, so that in particular, for example, uh, includes this example, because that's not a simple hole. It's a length three slit instead of a length two slit. Um, so these are all examples of non-simple holes. We see this original puzzle um, and lots of other fun holes that you could imagine. All of these fold into a cube and make nice puzzles. Um, so the, with the remaining open problem, still un, unsolved, is what about the simple holes? So if I just have a one by one hole, for example, uh, and if, if I had just this three by three shape with the one by one hole, that would not be enough. But if I add on this little one by one in the corner, 
that's enough. Or if I take uh, this L-shaped slit and add on this one square, that's enough. But if I add the one square somewhere else, maybe it's not. Um, if I take uh, this picture um, with the length two slit and I add these two rows and this extra square at the end, that's enough. But do I have to add all of those? I don't know. Um, so we still don't know how many extra squares you might need to add to the simple holes. Um, so lots of interesting unsolved problems there if you want to join in the fun. Um, and an another version, so that was one simple hole, but sometimes two simple holes are enough, but it depends how they're arranged. So we saw, for example, this one by one, uh, the two one by one holes uh, with one square between them. It also works if there's two squares between them or if they're offset in this funny way, um, or if you have these two slits offset in this way, but it doesn't always work to take two simple holes. So that's a, a larger class of problems. Of course, three simple holes and so on. I think at some point you should always fold into a cube, but uh, we also designed a mathematical font around this idea. Uh, if you are familiar with my work, you may know that we like to make fonts. So um, these are letters of the alphabet uh, carved out of a rectangle of paper uh, with these slits. Um, and each of them folds into a cube and at least one of the slits is necessary for it to fold into the cube. Though sometimes we add additional slits just to make it look like the letter. Um, and so this is a fun way to, uh, I guess, do, to encode the message, you could take one of these, fold it into a cube, give someone the cube, and then let them unwrap it and figure out what, what letter it made. Um, and this is part of a series of mathematical fonts. Some of them are based on origami. They're all based on either mathematical theorems or open problems that we've been exploring um, my um, usually with my dad um, and sometimes with other collaborators. Uh, they are recently featured in the New York Times, so you can check out uh, our website for, for those links, um, ericdomain.org. You can find the fonts. You can also, if you click on puzzles, you will find um, the cube folding puzzles that we originally uh, posed. Uh, they're all, you can print them out and uh, cut them out and try your hand at making, seeing how challenging these are for folding into cubes. And that's it, thanks. Thank you, Eric. Very fun and very cool as, as we all expect from you. <laughs> um, it, is, it is amazing how such a simple problem uh, leads to so many interesting questions, yeah. many of which we still don't know the answer to. And I see we have some questions here. Has anyone looked at folding that yields structurally supported shapes where every outer face is supported somehow by internal folds? Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, the short answer is no. <laughs> this is definitely an interesting direction to go, but there isn't a lot of mathematical study to, um, to more structural folding. And I think for cubes, it's not that big a deal. Um, but you saw, for example, I think part of the reason that the water bomb folding is designed with sort of extra material is so that it has more overlap and that makes it more structurally sound. Um, but especially when we get to more complicated shapes, um, we have like nice theorems for how to fold, say a long strip of paper into exactly whatever shape you want, but that's very flimsy and we need to have better ways to analyze which what foldings are more structurally supported. Maybe we could start with that in the cube, but um, part of the challenge there is just what's a good mathematical model that we can prove nice theorems. So I have a question. Yeah. Your, your unsolved cases with the simple holes, um, you mentioned that folding with holes is much more complicated. Does your software not analyze those cases or are they too, too complicated for this too, too large a search space? Um, I think, Software could be written to analyze mm -hmm. uh, simple holes, um, mm -hmm. but I think the code as currently written does not handle holes. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, I didn't write the code, so I don't remember offhand, but but conceptually you have, uh, when, when you have, uh, the, the code as it stands now only supports uh, tree duels uh, mm -hmm. when the there are no cycles of, of yeah. uh, of squares connected, even, even without holes, it wouldn't understand a two by two square. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we've talked about how to write an exhaustive search for, for such things, uh, sort of brute forcing on all the different uh, 
single vertex crease patterns you can have and then testing for global foldability. It's all doable. It's definitely a lot harder than the tree shaped case. Um, so we just haven't written that code yet, but if you want to write it <laughs> or if someone else <laughs> wants to write it, it would be, uh, it would settle. I mean, it would settle the finite cases, hopefully up to some size. Um, and then we'd need to prove a general theorem about larger sizes, but I think it would give some interesting, uh, especially when we talk about like the, the two, two hole case and how do they need to be spread around? I don't know that this is within the brute force range. It might be a bit large, mm -hmm. but I'm really curious what, what patterns work here and what don't. Sounds like a fun, fun project. How about Tesseract folding from cubes? Surely that <laughs> that'd yes. be. Right, that's natural. Uh, there was a talk about that earlier today, uh, showing the classic sort of uh, Dali cutting of the, or unfolding of hypercube. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of work to do. All the work that we did here, we should also do in that setting. You could, could still consider grid folding. You could still consider half grid folding, I think. Um, you could consider arbitrary uh, origami folding. There's a lot of, a lot of, exciting things to do there. It's just a lot harder to draw the pictures and to play with paper. But I think that'd be a really exciting direction to go, especially as we start to, we're still not out of them yet, but once we run out of cube folding <laughs> unsolved problems, I think hypercube would be a natural next step. Well, and then there's also other polyhedra, right? That, that can fold yes. from, from nets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like regular tetrahedron would be a I think it's nice to stick to simple ones. Just solving yeah. general case is going to be hard. Um, sure. There was a recent result. I hope I'm going to quote it right by uh, Satyan Devados uh, that showed that if you take you take a hypercube, and I believe you, no matter how you cut it, uh, this is cutting along ridges, which are two dimensional flats on the four cube, um, it will always unfold into um, a polycube without overlap. This works for a regular cube too. And I think all platonic solids, no matter how you cut them, when you unfold it into the plane, uh, you won't get any overlap among the, the, the polygons. That's not true for arbitrary polyhedra, but it's true for platonic solids in like regular 3D. Um, and it's also true for hypercubes, which is very, very cool result. Yeah. Doesn't mean all polycubes fold into that, but at least it means overlap is not, a, not something you need to worry about. Yep. Tyler says, I see that Rubik's magic is a two by four grid with a simple hole. <laughs> you answered a question that has nagged me for years. Can it fold into a cube? Is that, is that true? Hmm. Is it a two by four with a simple hole? I feel like there's some, some, a little extra going on in terms of the surfaces and how they're attached to each other. But if that's really all it is, I'm, I'm impressed. I, I feel like there's a little more <laughs> folds that migrate. Interesting. Yeah. I think it's not, um, Right. The way the folds work is not quite that simple. <laughs> yeah. Theoretically, this should should fold into a two by four. Mine is uh, not in a state where that's easy. But um, yeah, the folds are not are not fixed folds because you can get a fold that uh, stuff like this. Right. So that's the fold is migrating. So it's not quite the same question, I think. Yeah. I think also the which squares are connected to which other squares is migrating, which is even more yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think it's not obvious whether it could fold into a cube. <laughs> it might. Yeah. Um, it has, it's just grid folding though, right? So it's pretty hard yeah. for a size eight shape to grid fold into a cube. Sure. You only have two squares to spare. If you added but diagonal folds to Rubik's, Rubik's magic, or especially if you added half grid folds, then... Then all is that recredited Rubik's magic? No, this is an original. I mean, I probably haven't played with it for 15 years. Well, thanks everyone for coming. It's been fun. And thank you again, Eric. That was that was a lot of fun.